All right, everyone, welcome back. Uh, I think we're in session four. So um, before we uh, bring Mr. James Edge up to the uh, podium for his presentation, Information Security is Broken, uh, I'd like to go over his bio a little bit. James has over 15 years of information technology and security experience with backgrounds in state government, financial services, and private sector aviation and energy industries. James became an independent contractor in 2010 to bring his six years of state government experience as a security auditor and penetration tester to the private sector. In fact, that's where we first met him. He was part of an audit of KSU. Uh, James played a primary role in the sex successful information security assessments and penetration tests of the agencies and universities that manage the education, finances, human resources, transportation, and information technology for the states of Georgia and New York. Outside of work, James is actively involved in the Atlanta chapter of the Information Systems Audit and Control Association, or ISACA. James has been a guest speaker for the ISACA Atlanta and Hudson Valley chapters, the National Association of State Auditors, Comptrollers, and Treasurers, and the State University of New York. The range of presentation topics include password security, account management, and wireless security. James has been the instructor for the ISACA Atlanta CISA certification bootcamp for the past four years now? Three years. Hmm? Four years now, yeah. He's also served as a guest lecturer for Kennesaw State University's Computer Science and Information Systems Department and assisted in the Southeast Collegiate Cyber Defense Competition on behalf of the university. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm case you welcome to Mr. James Edge. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chris, for the, uh, the introduction. Um, Chris did just mention uh, one of the things uh, that I talk about, and I will be going into that during this session because it is a huge pet peeve of mine with how organizations treat passwords. That'll be one of the items that we talk about, but before we get into the agenda, uh, Chris did touch on a lot of the things. Um, I currently work for a consulting company as a adversarial engineer. I kind of moved away from the compliance aspect of information systems, no longer an auditor, no longer an analyst. I actually get to do the fun and sexy break into your corporation and steal all the things. So I've, I've been doing information security for 15 years, 12 that I have been in information security actually doing penetration testing um, along with the compliance work. So 12 years, so six years I was an auditor, 10 years total as a pen tester. I did waste away at a large organization as a security analyst, um, pretty much getting dumber by the day. Uh, luckily I decided to change careers and actually get back into the penetration testing. That's where Chris mentioned getting into the consulting aspect. So the actual overview, why is information security broken? And I'm gonna go over several topics to show you that it is broken. This is actually a talk I put together probably over three years ago and I've updated it for this because unfortunately things haven't changed. Things have only gotten worse. And frankly, it's sad and frustrating. So why is it broken? And this gets into the compliance aspect of things. Uh, last year I worked for an organization that dealt with uh, PCI DSS compliance. Anybody familiar with PCI, the payment card industry standard? There is a component of it that requires penetration testing. Um, one of the other items, it focuses on compliance. And you're still required to have antivirus, intrusion detection, intrusion prevention to quote unquote protect your environment. And we'll get into that a little bit. One of the other items I'm going to talk about why it's broken is patch management. It's still an issue in organizations and I'll actually be talking about and providing examples from over the years, including just within the last couple months of still these, issue, these issues exist within organizations. Password policy, like I said before, the biggest pet peeve of mine and really the main way that the attackers and that we get into your environment and like I said, steal all the things. Privileged users accounts, I will touch on that, uh, goes with 
uh, provisioning of accounts and assigning uh, roles and responsibilities and rights to users. Uh, the administrators in your network have all of the access and they take advantage of it. And then I'll touch on a little bit on uh, internal segmentation. In the world of firewalls where you're being attacked from the outside, even in the compliance world, uh, they take a look at the auditor, the, you audit the firewall logs, there's no any any, you're denying everything from the outside. The sad state of affairs is when you still get into the inside, you have access to everything. Even in the world of the payment card industry, they do require that you segment your network with your cardholder data. And this is one of the few uh, compliance requirements that are actually requiring this where you segment it. And they're still doing a poor job in that area uh, just because they limit the scope. Uh, just did a PCI engagement um, within the last month and I was able to get into the cardholder data and sit there and monitor the network and capture all the credit card data. Uh, they had the proper firewall segmentation, but if you use passwords that wouldn't be compliant back in the 80s, uh, to manage the boxes, uh, I'm gonna get in. Passwords, huge pet peeve. So, like I mentioned, some examples, I'll be talking about some of the research on the slides that'll show you uh, issues specifically with passwords and how we as human beings actually choose them, but I'll actually go into specific details of items that I've seen in the field as well as some demonstrations and we'll show you how quickly you can crack somebody's password. Even if, it, even if it meets all the compliance requirements, you just check that box. I will get into some solutions. Talk about things that organizations should do and things that we recommend when we do write up the reports and provide them to the customers that they should be doing to actually secure their environments above what they're doing to meet compliance and regulations. There'll be some time for some question and answer but if there's any questions during my talk, just feel free to raise your hand. I do like a little bit of audience participation, and so I just wanted to, to gauge your interests, your backgrounds, what you're studying, if you're students. So how many students here? Excellent, so with the show of hands, uh, how many people, all right, First, we'll start off with information security. Are, are we in some form of information systems or security program? Is it, and we can, and if it's something different, just yell out. Um, is it IT? Yeah, information tech. Okay, it is technology as well. Okay, so this, I mean, from an in information technology and security perspective, everything that I'm going to discuss was very helpful for you when you go out into the world and either work on the operations side or the compliance side and hopefully some of you get lucky to get into information security and do the, do the fun stuff, breaking into systems. How many here, is this uh, extra credit from a professor <laughs> to come and participate? I saw, I saw Steve counting out uh, uh, having people raise their hands uh, from the last talk. So let's get into the heart of matter, information security. This is pretty much for the people that are actually in it on the ground, working in operations, even, even the auditors out there uh, doing the compliance, checking the boxes, and then the people that are trying to break into systems and secure things, this is pretty much how it is. You're just running, you're just spinning in hamster wheel. So I did a little data research, and it's still a sad state of affairs, and it looks like things are getting worse, um, but I do think it's because organizations are now required to report on these issues. But just doing some data, just from the first half of this year, there's been over 1,800 incidents reported, over a billion records compromised. Now, the organizations listed below aren't all from this year, but they're still some of the biggest, and they, were, they had the, the biggest headlines when they happened, and even some of them happened over a decade ago. There's still some of the largest breaches uh, to occur. Is anybody familiar um, with uh, some of these organizations in the breach? Adobe, Target, Home Depot, um, TJ Maxx, that was one that was about a decade ago. Yeah, I think the auditors is the most recent. It's like 14 million records. Wow. Yeah, pretty much, yeah. It's like, it's like all the records. Um, LinkedIn's a huge one. Uh, that's fun for uh, actual password analysis. Um, 
being able to crack those password hashes. I mean, I can look myself up, look my email address up and crack and obtain the password that I used at the time. Um, I'm sure everybody here that has a LinkedIn account has got the notification from them to change your password. And they're actually smart now. If, you're, if your account's dormant and if somebody tries to log in with those older credentials, uh, they'll say the account's disabled and they'll ask you to actually change your password. Yahoo just happened. That one, we'll see if the, there's an actual financial impact to that. They were in the process of being acquired. We'll see if that goes through. Uh, TJ Maxx, that was a, a one that uh, happened years ago and it's still one of the largest breaches uh, to have occurred. I think it's still in the top 20 global. Now here's the problem though, and this is why information security is broken. We're talking about all these records that have been obtained and TJ Maxx is a perfect example. I was actually there yesterday. I was at TJ Maxx. Have they been affected at all? They're still here. I'm from the Northeast and I've, I was actually there recently doing a pen test up in New Hampshire and I still know that Hannaford is still one of the major uh, grocery store chains uh, for the Northeast. So they are still there. I can confirm that. There was a, when I went to TJ Maxx, I, when I left, I walked right next to the Target that was next door. But here's the interesting thing, and I guess one of the things that I, I want to stress, that yes, these companies have been breached, uh, but what I want to stress to you, even though information security is broken, it is it will be your job to go out there and help protect these organizations and protect the resources. Now, so while these organizations still are still here, when these breaches occur, will you be still here? And just kind of insinuating what would your job be if you were at fault for one of these breaches? Asking if you want fries with that. Here's an article that just came out a couple weeks ago that I threw into these slides, because this is, it is interesting, because there was a study done that did the analysis of the cost per breach for organizations, and the results of that study were, it is cheaper to do nothing. And if you are breached, handle it just as any other risk and move forward. And that's a sad state of where we are because it is our data that's being compromised. Um, attackers still go after credit card numbers because there's no risk to us aside from I have to log into Amazon now and update my credit card information because I've been assigned a new card and I gotta change the number. That's the risk that we have. Um, from a compliance perspective, the payment card industry is trying uh, to get ahead of it when they've created the PCI D DSS standard so that government regulation won't get involved, but it's not a silver bullet. And I will get into those details because I'll be going over what those compliance requirements are. Steven. So, and I'm, so the question I have, and I'm curious about your thoughts. So there, it's cheaper to get hacked with those strong IT defenses. So with the proliferation of like cloud services and risk transference via contracts with third parties, I mean, do you see really kind of that growth of, instead of you know housing infrastructure internally, let's outsource it and take all the risks of breach and put it off on those contracts with those companies that are you know, hosting our EMS system, our e whatever system it may be. So, I'll try to condense uh, that question based on the cost of risk. And that actually leads into one of the reasons why it is cheaper. Uh, organizations are outsourcing the risk. And in the payment card industry and the credit card industry, that is, the, that is the perfect example. Because of the regulations, instead of housing the credit card data internally, they are tokenizing the credit card numbers and sending the information and having it handled by a third party whose responsibility it is to handle that information. So it is going to the cloud. Um, Salesforce is growing in, by leaps and bounds handling uh, information for organizations in the cloud uh, with regards to sales and HR uh, and other enterprise management solutions. Um, so to that it is, they, the problem is it's still, you're still ultimately responsible if the data, um, and this was an older one, it actually raises a, um, 
a problem with outsourcing it. Uh, I used to have this in my slides as one of the larger breaches and actually affected a company, and it's a Atlanta based company that handed, they were one of the bigger credit card processors, uh, Global Payment Solutions, and they got breached. So they were managing the credit card information for all these organizations. They just became a target. Just because you outsource the information doesn't mean the company is, is actually have your best interest in protecting that information. Yes? Uh, why is it So the question was why uh, would you wait, why is it cheaper uh, to get hacked as opposed to building strong defenses? And it, it really comes down to risk. And there are formulas in managing risk of rate of occurrence based on the cost. And you're really leveraging the fact that you may not get hacked in one year. You, you may measure it out in a, in a, a five year or a 10 year window. So that cost gets cut. And from that study that I, let's see, go back to that. From that study and the research they did uh, from all the organizations, I think it was around maybe just $200,000 uh, per breach. Now, all the time organizations are getting breached, small, medium, and large. And usually it's just the larger ones that make it to the news. So wh whether it's a, a ransomware incident where they had to uh, disinfect some workstations, um, th that cost, or they actually had to pay. Um, anecdotally, I know uh, people in the industry, they, there was a, a hospital that got hit with that and they had to pay $14,000 in Bitcoins uh, to get their data back because there was no way that, it, from a time perspective, you need your business to function. Downtime is, uh, is something that uh, you can't have in a hospital setting. So you pay the ransom, get your data decrypted. It's just, it's a numbers game. And it is cheaper. Um, the products and solutions are actually difficult to implement. I mean, there's a lot of organizations out there that'll sell you blinky light boxes and say that they'll be the silver bullet to fix all the things. It'll collect all the data and alert you um, when bad things happen. And I am living proof up here for based on the job that I do. And I can tell you beyond a shadow of a doubt that those things don't work. Mostly because they're not implemented correctly. There's not manpower to monitor them. Um, the human capital, human resource is probably the most expensive thing when it comes to managing a security program on top of the, uh, the cost of the solutions themselves. So sadly, it's, it is just cheaper um, to do that and to retroactively fix the issues if you do get breached. And you can show that from a financial impact, uh, we're still shopping at TJ Maxx, Marshalls, Home Goods. Uh, we're going to Target. Not everybody's flying, you know, flocking to, to Walmart. Um, so it's just, it is the nature of things. So just went over those particular items. Uh, so we're going to get into the details, um, issues with antivirus, issues with patch management, issues with uh, password compliance and policies, touch on privileged users and get into network segmentation. So antivirus, the majority of these solutions, and I'm lumping in intrusion detection, intrusion pre prevention, they're mostly signature based. You have to wait for the malware uh, to actually be released. So that means somebody's going to be a victim before it's detected and the signature's written. So it's an arm race that we just can't, you just can't win. Mostly required, <coughs> mostly required for compliance reasons. Uh, I have this chart up here, it's not factually accurate, but this is pretty much simulates the number of malware variants that over the years it just, it has increased exponentially and the vendors themselves just cannot keep up. Yes, yeah, steep curve is steep. So, and one of the easy things to do and that we do in our testing is you create a piece of malware that you're gonna use and you test it before you send it against your target. You're able to test it against different uh, different products to see if it's going to be detected. Um, the one in the bottom, uh, Virus Total, it's owned by Google, and you're able to send your malware to them and it'll get checked against all the antivirus solutions to see if there's hits. Now, when you do submit that, they do take that malware and they'll start to create a signature for it, um, but there's ways around that. One, install your own antivirus uh, software and test it, or just create a hash of that and do a lookup to see if it's ever been detected. So you test it before you use it. 
one of the other items is is most antivirus solutions and they're starting to get better they only test if the malware has touched the hard disk a lot of the tools now and a lot of the malware that's out there is just stays resident in memory there's the initial exploit the initial compromise and then it's loaded in memory and it stays in memory it doesn't touch it does not touch the disk it does not get detected when we get into the password part of this thing, I'll talk about how malware is not even needed. Um, the greatest gift that Microsoft has ever given is uh, PowerShell and the use of that uh, scripting language uh, to be able to compromise the environment. Uh, it's part of the operating system, so it's not going anywhere. And other powerful scripts uh, like Python are, are popular to be used, um, so you don't even need to write a, uh, a fancy exploit. Patch management. Some of the interesting things, um, we actually have a guy uh, that works, uh, a colleague of mine at the company that I work for, and one of the things he likes to do in his spare time is wait for Patch Tuesday to come out. He will then take the patches and reverse engineer them and try to determine what the actual exploit was so that he could potentially build an exploit for that particular issue. Uh, a lot of organizations, they do patch bundling. Uh, this is common with Oracle, with their Java and their, their database products. Uh, it won't be every month. Um, they'll wait and put out a large patch. It's interesting, zero days do exist. Most of the time you don't need them. It really comes down to, and this will be an additional slide about patching windows and how long before organizations even apply those patches. Of course, unless you're the NSA and then you hold on to them until they're leaked. Um, if you're familiar with the Cisco uh, exploits that were leaked, that the NSA was holding on to for a couple of years. So it's interesting, organizations, how often do they patch? What, I, what, what have I seen? Is it 30 day? Is it 60 day? Uh, just did an assessment of an organization where they do not patch at all. That is their policy um, because they are heavily, their legacy environment heavily reliant on mainframe and custom built software. And they had one bad incident where a Microsoft patch broke things and their policy was to not patch anything. Of course, it's not just a Microsoft world. It's not just uh, Microsoft workstations and servers. Uh, there's a lot of issues that attackers are exploiting is the third party software, uh, exploiting uh, client side software, the Adobe's and Flash, um, PDF readers, the browser itself just by a simple phishing attack. So you gotta patch everything in the environment and organizations just aren't, or they're not doing it in a timely manner. The interesting thing is what version of Java are you using? I worked in an organization that had to support Java going back several versions because the software that was written, that was used within the environment, that they could not develop fast enough to, to use the latest version. So they had to have a security, a security exception in order to continue to use that older version, well, just leaves you vulnerable in the environment. And we take advantage of that. Uh, does your version of enterprise management <clears throat> solution allow you to even patch? Uh, there was a version of JD Edwards software that you couldn't go, you couldn't have passwords larger, longer than 10 characters. And we'll get into, when I get into the password part, how bad that actually is. 10 character passwords. That's not long enough. Um, just some resource, uh, if, they, if they post these slides uh, with this talk, there's an excellent article on how you should set up a patch management program within your environment. Also with a link <clears throat> to a, a podcast that can assist you in being able to put together a patch management solution that has almost instant turnaround time. And some of the things when we get into the end of uh, this talk with the actual solutions, I'll touch on those. All right, the topic that I love the most, password selection. So with all the compliance requirements, I've been a former auditor. I've gone in and done interviews in organizations and they provided their screenshots of how they enforce password complexity and they are compliant. They check the box, they're secure. No, they're so far from secure, it's, it's, it's laughable. And at this point in my career, it's not funny, ha ha ha, it's funny, so, so, so sad. Um, and I'll actually talk about 
So yeah, you enforce pass through complexity. There's upper, lower, special characters, digit, pick three. That's the default for Windows within its environments. So you upper, lower, digit, special character. So pick three of the four, and you have a sec secure password. Minimum password length. A lot of organizations, is it eight, is it nine, 10? Password expiration. You have to, according to compliance, you have to have password expiration. Is it 30 days, 90 days? Is it a year, General Electric? A year. So here's some screenshots because I, I have, <clears throat> excuse me, I have issue with the eight character password minimum. This screenshot here, it shows for uh, Windows 7, and the recommendation is to have a, a password that is at least eight characters long. Um, one of the things uh, Chris mentioned was I do boot camp training for a certified information systems auditor. I, I volunteer my time to keep up on the auditing standards, even though I haven't done auditing in a number of years. This is actually a slide uh, from the national organization, ISACA and I'm required to teach that for best practice, passwords should be a minimum of eight characters. So onto the, sl the saddest slide of them all, because I've been doing a lot of talking about PCI and their requirements. They require a minimum of seven characters for your password. Now, when I get in, I'll actually get into some actual theoretical numbers, and I will demonstrate using processing power how ridiculous eight and nine character passwords are in this day and age. Uh, there's some anecdotal talk about where the eight character came from, and one of the, the stories is that it was created by somebody in the 80s, because at the time, the computational power, that was, that was as strong as, uh, as you can get, and nobody would be able to crack that. Um, how many here were actually born in the 80s or before that? I know none of you, but all right, yes, all the adults. Well, I guess you guys are all adults too. Um, but yeah, it was a long time ago. <clears throat> so here's the interesting thing when it comes to compliance and requiring password complexity. Now I'll just go through this slide. It's a popular slide that I like to use that demonstrates how ineffective it is for us to select a password. So I'll actually just read through the slide and it gets into the details of what a strong password is according to what's required of us. It gets into just the, the bits, the, the entropy of how many actual uh, guesses is required to crack that. And really it comes down to password length is stronger than any form of complexity you can assign. Think of it as your paycheck. If you added an extra zero at the end of it, how much of exactly? So just adding an extra, one extra digit to the end of the password exponentially increases the complexity. So while, and I blow up the sentence at the end of it, because essentially through 20 years of effort, we've successfully trained ourselves to pick passwords that are hard for us to remember, but ridiculously easy for computers to figure out. And we're talking seconds yet it's difficult for us to remember. Do you guys, I don't know if you were reading on the screen, do you remember what the password was uh, when it came to concatenating four words? I think it was bass, uh, horse, battery. So you'll remember that forever. Just don't choose that as a password. No, a lot of, a lot of attackers know about that. Um, but yeah, just concatenating four words. Easy to remember, you can't crack it. And here's why it's so easy to crack passwords. Now this is a screen that I grabbed from the internet. This is actually, this screen's a couple years old. But people are building password cracking rigs. This actual image is from a site that talked about building a Bitcoin mining rig. And the reason graphics cards work so well is the math required for the latest game to have the best graphics also works really well for crunching numbers and cracking passwords. When you talk about your desktop computer and it's got four cores, it's a four core Pentium, whatever, it's eight core, our cell phones have four cores in them now. These graphics cards have 
four thousand cores maybe i think for the latest card four thousand per car in this particular rig just this picture there's four of them string together so when we're talking about we'll get into actual we'll get into theoretical number crunching and actual so we're going to talk about the password hash that windows has been using for 20 years to protect your passwords uh, on your domain controller and on your servers and workstations the um, ncLM so for the hardware, and I grabbed this off of a password cracking site of the tool that I use from three years ago, where they had eight AMD R9s, uh, 290X, and at the time, they are able to do 141 billion guesses a second. So we'll get into the math when it comes to eight character passwords and how many actual options there are with only eight characters. So 141 billion a second. Now, real world, uh, this is the uh, password cracking rig that we actually have uh, in the office. And it is six NVIDIA 1080s. Anybody do gaming at all? I mean, talk about PC Master Race. If you had one of these cards, you'd be doing pretty well. It's actually, I won't be able to test this actual rig uh, live. We'll have to just use the dinky graphics card in my machine at home because it's being taken apart so a seventh card can be, net, can be added. Now, the actual output, yes, Steve? How much is the power supply on that monitor? 3,000 watt? There's two of them, actually. There's two power supplies. Um, yeah, we actually had to look into, uh, in the office, the, the circuit box to see if there was enough amps to handle. Um, <laughs> It'll keep the office, we'll, we'll, have, we'll pay less for our heat bill um, when this thing's running during the winter time, um, when, it, when it's in use. So yeah, there's two, there's two power supplies stacked underneath the, uh, the SATA hard disk to the right. And from, so again, I'll be talking about theoretical when it mentioned 141 billion a second. This actual rig itself will do 96 billion a second. So uh, getting to the actual math, an eight character password. So for the password complexity, if you were to take that and enforce all four options from, and we'll just keep to the English language, we'll keep to the standard English uh, keyboard, we're talking about 32 possible special characters. We're talking about 10 digits, 26 upper, 26 lower. So when you do the math, if you're gonna use all those possibilities, 94 to the eight, you got eight, or excuse me, six quadrillion Possibilities. And this is why length matters. If you had a nine character password, that goes up to 573 quadrillion. Those are big numbers. However, eight character password, NTLM encryption, 12 hours. It'll burn through every combination, all six quadrillion. For the nine character password, it'll take 47 days. That's a huge increase in time, but it's actually still doable, especially since a lot of organizations have a 90 day change policy. And this is still in the realm of theoretical because no human being chooses random passwords, like truly random passwords. And we'll get into how you actually choose your passwords, how everybody in this room chooses their password. Again, length matters, 10 character password, 12 years, you're not cracking it if it's random. And it's not random. Your password is not random. Your password, more likely, more often than not, it's a dictionary word, first letters capitalized, followed by some digits. That meets the password complexity. And that's every organization that I've done a pen test against for the last, I don't know how many years, 10. It hasn't changed. Some examples, day of the week, Monday, followed by a number. Usually that number, I can figure out when that employee started with the company with a 90 day password change policy, just 90 days times 66, that's the number of years they've been there. They've just been using the same password. And that's why password change policies don't work. And I have some more examples coming up because you just increment the number at the end. Password one is still so common, it makes me sick. And that meets, that's PCI compliant. That's nine character password. They only require seven. 
or it's company name one, two, three, company name one. I'm not gonna put up the, uh, the guilty, um, but it's every company. So with a 90 day expiration policy, a lot of, a lot of people, and this is, how we, this is how we get in from the outside. I just did a, an external penetration test against a Citrix portal where I was limited to choosing one password a day and I got in on day four. These are actual examples from a password assessment that we did for an organization. This is one employee where we can see the password history. So during the cracking, they didn't have a 90 day, they had a 60 day. So they weren't changing their password every season. They had to mix it up a bit. And literally from winter 16 to spring to summer, those are the passwords that they selected. And you just need one employee to do this. And unfortunately there's multiple. I had nine hits on my last day with the password that I selected. Luckily the organization was nice enough to put on their website that their password policy where it had to be eight characters and it had to have a special character. So it was uh, summer 2016 with an exclamation point at the end. There's 32 special characters on a keyboard and the exclamation point is the most common one selected. So did you have all the usernames of the company to then like try the passwords? Like, so how did you match those up? That um, when you do a dump of Active Directory and get the database, it'll provide, you can ask for the password history and it'll list because one of the policies, if, and it's also if it's set in policy, one of the things I don't talk about is your password can't be the last eight remembered. So you'll get those hashes and you crack them, you can actually see patterns and use that to maybe obtain the latest password if that's something that you didn't have. They required the person, it was fall 2016 with an exclamation point, they required that person to change their password. And when we, when we finally completely compromised them and got the database dump, I went and looked what they changed their, what one of the people changed their password to and it was winter 2016 bang. So I tried summer 2016 um, and got in, but if I had tried winter, I was waffling between those two seasons of what, what would work next. And they actually did just change the month on their password. With 30 day expiration policy, a lot of the times you're just gonna see the month used. That's not a complex password that's on the screen right there. That's just a keyboard pattern. You may think you're being slick, but it's really easy to program uh, password cracking to check for those patterns. Done automatically. So, getting into the actual pattern matching and actual cracking of passwords, I mentioned that if you used a truly random password for eight characters, it was six quadrillion options. And I just show it with some password examples that as humans, we don't choose passwords like that so with a password pattern of first letters capital followed by some lowercase digit thinking that it's, it's going to be a word a dictionary word and then some numbers thrown at the end to meet the password complexity requirements you're only talking about 31 billion options so the password cracking rig that we have that does 96 billion in a second so how quickly would i get through every single one less than a second I will actually demonstrate that on just one graphics card. That's a lot cheaper than a 10, than an NVIDIA 1080. So if you get a little more complex, you talk about nine character passwords. I think that was uh, 573 quadrillion options if it was truly random, but we're human. So, and I, I think but this particular one's actually a 10 character password. I mean, it's a bigger number. Trillions bigger than billion, 40 trillion options. And then finally, maybe we'll stick a special character at the end if it's required. You're talking about 164 trillion. So let's get into uh, how long those items take with one graphics card. I think it cost me a couple hundred bucks. But it does have over 1,600 cores. So we'll talk about eight characters. And I actually want to show this to you.
While I bring this up, is there any questions? Is this is this new information? Is it surprising, shocking? I will describe as this as things fly by the screen because I know that the, the text is a little bit small. But we I have a hash file I hashed out and this 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 is a file from years ago from former former employers. Uh, we're talking about twelve thousand unique hashes within the organization. So we're going to see how fast we can go through all eight characters if they were truly random, how long it would take for this one graphics card. So to go through Eight characters. So okay, eight characters going through all the hashes. For this one graphics card, it will be eight days, twelve hours. So anybody can do this. A couple hundred dollars. Now that's in the realm of theoretical. We were talking about how people actually choose passwords. Yeah, go ahead. So if the if you have like a brown out on either out. I actually had the power go out and I had to upgrade my UPS um, because it did die. Now, I, see, the thing is, I don't have things running for eight hours. It doesn't take that long. The stuff that we do with the password cracking, and I'm not even talking about just using a dictionary, which is way faster than doing actual brute forcing. So we're talking about eight character password, uppercase letter. Couple digits at the end. Now you actually see this one actually just I thought I saw a Monday in there. I was done. So those are all the passwords. So it got it got twelve almost thirteen percent of this organization in three seconds. Those are eight character passwords. One of the other th items that I talk about is a 10 character password where the word. Does this assume then that they have the, uh, the password file or the file of the password locally? I do, with this, I did obtain the actual password hashes. Um, unfortunately, there is many different ways you can obtain a password hash, um, and I'll actually go into a little bit uh, details of some of the tools used just to grab the password right out of memory. And actually, you don't even need to crack the password in Windows. If you get this hash, you can just pass it and authenticate. It's a feature in the Windows. So I'm changing up the uh, the rule. We're talking about a 10 character password. Now I didn't go into the math of how many options that was. Remember nine characters was 573 quadrillion potential options. And that was gonna take, I think 30 or 40 something days. And that 10 character was 12 years. So we don't know how large that number is, but from a human perspective and how we choose passwords, with this particular password mask. It would run in 11 minutes. And this is where, again, first letter's capitalized. So we're talking about a word. 
and then it could either have four, three, or two digits at the end. So I'm mixing a digit and a, and a lowercase letter in there so we can see some of the passwords found um, mostly have four digits at the end. That was days of the week. And again, this is brute force, so even if you did use random uh, letters or a non-English word, this would be captured. It would be correct. Is it still just using a word list? Or no, there's no word list. So then what's the point? If, if it's brute forcing that fast or that mask, then what's the point in doing a complex password? Because it's just going to, isn't it going to break it in the same amount of time? Exactly. And the question was, what's the point of selecting a complex password? There is no point. It's actually something that's still required. And based on that comic that I showed you, we have trained ourselves to select passwords that are hard to remember, but easy for computers to crack. And it's longer. The longer the password, the better. You're talking 20 character password using just regular dictionary words. It's not going to be. I'm going to guess you don't use air Because of the complexity of the uh, the password, that that actually is one of the still one of the strongest encryptions used, the WPA2, and it is difficult. It, it depends on what they assign for a password, but that takes a lot longer to get. It depends on what they choose. Yeah, you can't brute force that. It comes down to a dictionary. So I'm, I guess I'm still in the realm of theoretical with most of the time we don't do random brute forcing of passwords um, because just using a dictionary. With some modifications, uh, some rules files that go through the dictionary word and will substitute those special characters that we think we're so smart that we use an at sign instead of an A or a dollar sign instead of an S. It is the, the rule files will check that. They will append digits to the end of the password. They will capitalize the first letter. And I'm using a common dictionary that was leaked, uh, referred to as the, the Rock U dictionary, uh, because when they were compromised, they did not encrypt their passwords. So it's a true list of how people would choose passwords. So it's just going. 56%. Got three minutes left. 56% of all the passwords in the organization. Yes. I do have a question. Sure. Coming, coming from an absolute noob when it comes to this, right? I, I have an interest in this. I don't really know much about it, right? So I see how you generate the passwords, right? Because you have a, a special algorithm and whatnot, right? But how is this actually applied? Like, how do you how do you actually crack, right? Like, how, how I put this? You you've got a, you, okay. Uh, let me refine this. Your client, right? Mm -hmm. you, you get you generate the passwords, right? The possibilities, right? And we've got hundreds of po not hundreds, but millions of possible possible passwords. Right? Yes. So how can how do you have to manage to find the right one? Okay, so you're getting into the theoretics of how you actually crack passwords, and it's actually it depends on what the encryption used was and the tool that I demonstrated. Uh, I was just t doing the test against one type of encryption, uh, the NTLM encryption uh, for Microsoft. So you actually have to know how, what encryption technology is used. So then what the tool does, will take the password from the dictionary, apply whatever rules to it, and then we'll run through that same algorithm, take and it will produce the hash, the unique hash for that password, and it'll compare to the hashes that you obtained. And a lot, NCLM is actually the gift that keeps on giving because it's ridiculously easy from a computational perspective to crack. Now, what was mentioned before with the air crack tool, the, the WPA2 protocol, they got that right. 
and they made it computationally intensive to be able to do that same process. There are many different types of hashing algorithms and this tool supports a lot of them. So there's a lot of different options. You can see as it scrolls by and they keep adding more and more. So you're gonna, you know, older encryptions used in Unix environment, Solaris environment, or the more modern encryption used uh, for the latest version of Ubuntu. Go ahead, go back. Oh, I'm sorry, I, I was, I'll, I'll get to you in a sec, the gentleman in the back. No, that is the encryption used to protect uh, Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi protected access. What, um, how would it change the, the password cracking equation if, like, uh, some hacker, he, he uh, got a bunch of uh, hash files, but they were all salted, and then the salt, the salts and the hash were somewhere else, and he couldn't get those, and all they had was, like, the salt in there. That is an excellent question. Um, asking a question about obtaining hashes that use a salt, and just to go into uh, a salt would make a password unique. The password hash should be unique to that password and without getting theoretical, and again, NTLM is a gift that keeps on giving, they don't use a salt. So if you find a password hash and you find another account with that same password hash, it's the same password. And what salting does, it makes it more difficult. Uh, you'd have to crack every password. That list of those 12,000 NTLM hashes, those are the unique ones in the environment there's probably 30,000 accounts used. And I see this a lot, and I do, I make it a point to report on this, that X number of accounts use the same password. Um, one of the things I'll get into about uh, privileges is that you have an admin user and a regular user, and it's required by compliance. And I can see just from the password hash that I've captured, I don't even have to crack the password. If they're the same, you're using the same password for your regular user account and your administrator. So why even bother having to separate accounts. You see this everywhere, and it's a compliance requirement. But people, we're human beings, you set it to the same password. So it does make it more difficult. You'd have to crack each hash. There's no guarantee it would be the same password. Though, the salts are included in the password hash. It's part of the, uh, how it works, because the, how the algorithms work with, with, uh, with salting. Yeah, go see. So with Server 2008 R2, I thought NTLM was like you had to actually set a group policy exception to accept NTLM. Now there there you may be talking about um, net NTLM across the wire when it comes to Yeah, it's a that's a different uh, password in, uh, encryption. And actually all the versions of net NTLM are a, a little bit stronger than NTLM. Um, so but when it comes to what's stored in your domain controller and what's stored on disk. It's still just NTLM version two, which has been around since the 90s. NT4, uh, Service Pack 4 or something was when the first time they introduced version two and it's still in use. All right, so we're gonna get away from the fun of the password cracking and talk about some, uh, actually what I just touched on when it comes to privileged users. You get a regular user that's uh, that compromised. A lot of times it is through a phishing attack As attackers and adversaries, you seek to elevate privileges within the environment. So one of the issues is, you're either going to try to elevate privileges on that machine, still a lot of times the users are local administrator on that box. Uh, the latest versions of Windows are doing a better job in protecting from that. Or we're gonna seek out additional hosts. Again, the great thing about uh, the NTLM that it doesn't use a salt, if you take that hash, you can try it throughout the environment and see where that user and where those credentials work. You don't even have to actually have the corresponding plain text. So you go after administrator workstation. Just mentioned, maybe that administrator has a separate user account that doesn't have domain level privileges. Unfortunately, a lot of times they use the same password. A lot of different ways to obtain the password hashes. Those are the uh, registry files that are used on the local system that you would capture and do offline analysis. 
works in the latest version of Windows. Now, some of the more antiquated encryption technologies, anybody familiar with Land Manager Hash? Now, I, actually, I will speak real quickly to the Land Manager Hash because even though that's eliminated from, from most environments and the idea of rainbow tables and the lookup, it is actually faster now to crack without even without using our crack in rainbow tables. It's faster to just crack it using GPU technology than, than using our crack. It's, that's how fast computational power has gotten. You don't even have to do the, the one-off uh, rainbow tables. And even the ones for NTLM, they take forever. I don't, even, I don't even use them. And they take up like nine terabytes of data on disk. One of the other interesting things is that Microsoft has done some things in their environment with the latest version of Windows 8 and Windows 10 and Server 2012. Um, but one of the big attack vectors is that once you compromise a host and get administrative access on it, uh, Microsoft was nice enough uh, for single sign-on purposes to actually place your password in memory in clear text. So when they fixed some of the, the weaker encryption technologies that, were, that people were taking advantage of, we looked for other avenues and found, hey, for a decade, you've been just storing the password in memory, and we can just go and get it. So when I talk about memory dump analysis, uh, you don't even have to use malware. Microsoft has a tool where you can just dump that portion of memory for offline analysis. So when it gets back into the compliance of having antivirus in your environment and why it's broken. So you just copy the file over. It's about 60 meg files, quick to copy over and just off, offline, you just get a nice text file that shows you what the clear text password is. Doesn't matter how complex it is, it's in clear text. So, probably the last 15 minutes, I'll actually get into, I just told you the world's on fire. Um, so what are some of the things uh, that we should be doing? Make sure your antivirus signatures are updated because that is the, the end all be all to know. Don't even worry about antivirus. Uh, when you go out into the world and have to make a recommendation for an antivirus solution, don't listen to the sales weasel that's trying to sell you on um, some silver bullet. We still have to have it per compliance and it does catch some things. Again, if you're the initial target, it's not gonna help you. Just hope you're not the first one. So don't spend a lot of money on it. And just, if you wanna, if mom and dad, grandma and grandpa ask you like, what should they have on their computer? Just go with Microsoft Security Essentials, it's free. That's, don't spend a cent on antivirus. One of the big things, and I put this in here because there's an organization that is doing a pretty good job in using this, uh, application whitelisting. So only the programs that you use for business are allowed to run on that machine. Now that is way easier said than done. And again, if these slides do get posted, there's an excellent article from NIST about how to implement that. The particular organization that's doing this, again, they write their own custom software and only that software should run on those machines. Everything else should be blacklisted, not allowed to run. So that's, that's, that's the best case scenario. And that would have helped target out a lot on their, uh, on their point of sale workstations if they had some whitelisting. So they can set up a lot of these workstations so they, they, they just can't run, like, install it. They can only run, the, and it, these are point of sale terminals that I, I was talking about with this client. They can only run that software. That's all you need to do that, you know, unfortunately, all the point of sale terminals now, they're just computers that can run any executable. So um, they're potential points of attack and Target was a perfect example that malware sat on those machines just collecting the credit card information. So that actually is one of the directions that this particular uh, company went with is to install a whitelisting solution. But it is way easier said than done. So with regard to patch management, one of the best case scenarios is, is to push the patches out. Put together a list of users that are kind of tech savvy within your organization and have the patches applied to their workstations first, and then apply them organization wide. You definitely need to know what's installed on your workstations. It's not just about the Windows patches, you gotta care about the third party. Um, bad guys are getting in through phishing attacks. They're gonna exploit the third party software, your browser, PDF reader, Flash. Unfortunately, a lot of organizations, they're trying to get rid of some of these solutions, but in a lot of actual companies, you need an older version of Java. You need to have Flash because your 
super important application was written with that older technology and you haven't migrated away from it. If it works, you're not going to change. So for the password management, there's not a thing you can do. No, I'm just kidding. There are plenty of things you can do. And one of the things that we've done, uh, we actually audit for organizations their password management. We'll actually crack your passwords for you. Um, but if you want to do it in-house, you first have to capture them and definitely have permission uh, to do so. You can capture them over the, the, the wire. Um, you can whitelist applications because they are considered malware to dump them from workstations. Or you can just grab the actual Active Directory database and extract the files and information. Password education is huge, and hopefully I have educated you. Even though when you go out into the world, you're still going to have to have that checkbox where you're going to have to have password complexity. You're going to have to have a special character, which will most likely always be an exclamation point at the end um, to meet that complexity. Length matters. You really need to move to past phrases, stringing words together. They're easier to remember. Unfortunately, a lot of, in our everyday life, different sites, they, they're in the compliance world, PCI, credit cards, your banking website, they may not allow a 20, 25, 30 character password. It's unfortunate. So getting the education out. Now I didn't change this. This is actually a recommendation that I had in a slide from, uh, from three years ago. I mean, I would up it to 16 now. There is, uh, just did uh, another client. They require 12, it's a government organization. They require 12 minimum, and it was harder. It actually, you can't brute force that, so it really came down to uh, dictionary attack, using dictionary words. Again, we're humans. They append some numbers at the end. You just had to get one hit, um, but you're not going to be able to brute force it. Unfortunately, you're going to be required to have special characters, but don't think you're special when you substitute an at symbol for the letter A. It's, it doesn't make your password any more secure. So substitution is bad. Now this one's interesting because it actually helps out with online attacks is to have an account lockout. Set it to three. I mean, it may increase some of the help desk calls, but a lot of organizations have Im implemented solutions where a user can go and reset their own password. So this is excellent in those environments. And have the lockout for five minutes. That's going to severely limit an attack of somebody that gets into your network. Now, don't set it for infinite. Just, uh, just had another client where they had it set to that. I could do a denial of service against their organization because their accounts would all be locked out and they'd be locked out indefinitely until they called the help desk. Just having it for a few minutes will be able to help prevent attacks when an adversary is on your network. But even with that organization with infinite account lockout, um, that's why they required us to do only one a day, because the only way you could reset that lockout counter is actual user authenticating the next day when they get into work. So it took four days. It took four passwords. Four passwords before there was we successfully compromised accounts. With the privileged users, in the Windows domain environment, one of the things I see is way too many administrators. Whether it's actual human beings or service accounts to run some form of software, everyone's being lazy. There should be only one of each of the main administrator accounts. You need to get with the vendors to figure out what privileges are needed. You can get very granular with the assignment of privileges in the Windows domain. Get with the vendor and figure out what privileges are needed. The last item, force administrators to use a least privileged account, I had to actually add an extra bullet point to that um, because while that is good, in the real world, they just use the same password. So you need to audit and make sure that they are using different passwords and not just slightly different, completely different. One of the recommendations we have is also requiring a longer password for administrators. I rarely see an administrator that uses a different password for their less privileged account. You're going to be hacked. Whatever company you go out and work for, assume it. 
do with it. <laughs> but getting hacks is not the end of the world. Being able to detect the intrusion and respond to it. It's not a successful breach that the adversary gets in and doesn't make out, doesn't get away with all your data. So being able to log and monitor those items to see indicators of compromise. For the employee, security awareness is key, especially best example is with phishing. Whenever we do a phishing campaign, one of the recommendations we always push is that every one of us here is eventually gonna fall for something. Because phishing emails don't have misspellings in them. That is such a, I've seen security awareness training. I mean, maybe if it's a, if it's a translation issue, if it was somebody from a foreign country, but if you're being targeted, and a lot of organizations are being targeted, it's gonna look as real as possible. So you're gonna click. Your C-level people are gonna be targeted, especially financial. Best way to make off with money is an ACH transfer. That's one of the things with the risk is on the business. Your money's gone. So it really is true, the, the, the phrase from 9-11, see something, say something. Your users should be trained that if you have an oops moment, that there's somebody that you can reach out to and contact with no repercussions so that the incident response process can be initiated. Because again, you're hacked, that's no big deal. They didn't make off with your data yet. So to reiterate the last line, it's about detecting. We've been focusing a lot on prevention and that still needs to be pushed. But as I've gone through this talk, information security is broken and part of it's okay because we're all human. So being able to detect and prevent lateral movement within the environment, elevation of privileges. There is no real perimeter anymore. Unfortunately, with organizations, it's hard outside, soft, chewy inside. I've said this for years in talks, the m and theory, hard outside, soft inside. You don't see a lot of segmentation of your internal network. With the PCI compliance, you do have to segment your cardholder data from the rest of the environment. But I see that used with firewalls to where the user accounts are still the same. And if I obtain a local administrator password and that same password is used on 70 other of your systems, including the ones in your cardholder data environment, there's no segmentation. And if I'm able to communicate, find one box that is allowed to talk into that firewalled off environment, it's game over. <sighs> Truthfully, it should be firewalling every workstation. Because one of the things that attackers use, if they compromise one workstation, they'll, they'll try to find a workstation of an administrator. Workstations don't need to be communicating with each other. Peer-to-peer -peer networking died decades ago. You should only be able you know, to communicate with the servers that are needed for business. They shouldn't be talking to each other. So the bullet points that just came up, just reiterate. So here's my contact information, the company I work for. You can reach out to that email, um, but I'm also putting down my personal email if you have any questions. Um, I know there's been questions throughout this talk. Uh, are there any more? Go ahead. Okay, so you run Hashcat, and it dumps all these passwords, and you just said that you're in a situation where you can only pick one of them. So are you just taking the most probable password at a time, like the one that shows up the most when it comes to like an online attack, if I'm a, if I'm trying to, because I've been demonstrating a lot of offline. Um, well, with those, they weren't dumping the uh, usernames, right? Oh, I have that. No, I just do it. I I remove that um, information. There is a file when you extract it from the database has the username and the hash. I'm just the way Hashcat runs. You just especially for NTLM, you just need the straight hashes. So then I'll load all that into a database, do analysis, see what groups they're members of and then go from there. What is the, how does it marry to the 
It really just offloads some of the risk because you're going to have workstations in your environment. You're going to have servers. So yes, you're going to get hacked, but if your solution's outsourced, then maybe your data is not compromised. Unfortunately, if your internals are compromised, I'm going to look for your credentials for your Salesforce account and then log in. So it's there's still the risk of needing to be detected. Or unfortunately, choose your cloud providers wisely. If uh, there's no more questions, uh, feel free to come up and chat with me. I'll be here uh, for the other talks. Uh, so thank you very much. Hopefully this was eye-opening and educational. Thank you.